Cubs take on the Mariners tonight. Patrick Wisdom coming hard and uh, tearing it up in Iowa. He's ready to get back to the big leagues. Scott Boris thought that he was going to make a billion dollars in contracts. Yeah, it didn't work out quite that way, and he loses one of his star clients. I wonder if this is the start of him losing a lot of guys. Otani's interpreter stole $16 million from the Japanese legend. We're going to get into all that right here on the Cubs Baseball channel. Like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up if you like Cubs baseball, and uh, let's get this show started. Here's your invitation. He's Anthony Pasquale. I'm Mick Gillespie. Welcome to the Cubs baseball channel as the Cubs and the Seattle Mariners. One of those matchups that you never want to see. No, I'm just kidding. They, this is this is why I didn't like interleague play. But I guess yeah. if you're in Seattle, you do, right? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I always I never had a problem with it. Uh, my dad doesn't like it very much. He likes, you know, playing the Pirates and playing the Cardinals and the Brewers. But I do think if part of the goal of interleague play is to grow the game, yeah, let let more teams play Julio Rodriguez and play Shohei Otani and play Mike Trout, and that way the game grows a little bit. But yet, yeah, doing the playing the Dodgers at home and then going out west to play the Padres, then the Mariners, then the Diamondbacks, that's not an easy stretch, especially in April with a bullpen that's thinning by the day. So tough, tough matchup, tough series against a team that throws the ball really well. Um, they're, I think anybody would tell you their offense has not been what they've expected so mm -hmm. far in Seattle. They're still under 500, but, um, a really good team over there. There's a reason they were expected to potentially even win the AL West when you have the reigning champs in that division. Um, they're, they're a good team. Cubs have their work cut out for them this week. Yeah. It's still hard for me to believe that the Rangers are the world series champions, but we watched it. They got Bruce Bochy, and that changed their fortunes for them. One guy who is hard coming and wanting to get back to the major leagues is Patrick Wisdom. Another uh, big night for the Iowa Cubs. He he just continues to pound the baseball. And who knows? Maybe by the time you guys are watching this, he's already back. It, the tough part is where do you put him? But at the same time, I mean, you're, he's just mashing the ball everywhere. Yeah, it's honestly, it's too bad he's not a starter that can give you six innings worth of pitching because that's what the <laughs> Cubs need to bring up right now. But uh, Patrick Wisdom raking in Iowa, uh, I think a home run on Monday, another one on Wednesday night. So he's he's hitting the ball really well. He's seeing the ball really well. And, and that's something that you even noticed when you're out in Arizona that, you know, that the ball's coming off his bat in a big way. And, you know, we know he's got his flaws. We know he strikes out a lot, and we know he's pretty much a two true outcome guy, extra base hit or strikeout. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you're hitting that well in Iowa, you have a role in the big leagues. And I'm excited to see him come up. I think the fans like him a lot, too. And he's he's a guy that's good for the mold of your team. But like you mentioned, there, there's not really room for him. You have to make a tough decision. So where are you going with that if you have to bring up Patrick Wisdom? Well, I mean, maybe you designate uh, Cooper for assignment. I mean, because are you going to have him and Cooper on the same team? They kind of do the same thing, right? Backup first base, corner infield, power guys. Um, do you send Master Boney down? I'm I'm kind of becoming a Master Boney guy. I mean, just the fact that he's so versatile and he, he gives you a lot more round game as far as playing infield, shortstop, outfield, and running the bases. Uh, and I, you got to have a guy like that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, it's it's definitely curious. You, but you need that 40-man spot if you did get rid of Cooper for additional pitching because, I mean, obviously you just mentioned it. You know, right now the Cubs are desperate for arms. So I guess that could be the move. I, I It's a tough decision, though. One I wouldn't want to be a part of. <laughs> yeah, you can pretty much guarantee, you know, sometimes in these situations, maybe you'd send a reliever down and you'd bring up wisdom and you'd go with a big bench. But the Cubs need 
every pitcher that they have desperately right now. So you can guarantee if he does come up, it's going to be a hitter that gets sent down. And the question you have to ask is, do you want to have essentially two wisdoms or two master bonies? Because wisdom and Cooper essentially serve the same role. And right. um, I know you like master Boney a little bit more than I do, but he doesn't serve much more of a role than what Nick Madrigal is giving you too. Cause if you have Nick Madrigal healthy, he gets your spot starts at third and, and he could even play some second too. I know master Boney has a little bit of short that he can play, but if Swanson were to go down, maybe, you know, Horner slides over and someone else plays second, which Madrigal or Morell or whoever could also do. So I think personally you keep Cooper because he's looked a little better offensively. You haven't seen much of Master Boney. So I personally would would option Master Boney to triple A and bring Patrick Wisdom back up. But like you said, if they do decide to to let Cooper go, that clears up a 40 man spot that could open up a pitcher to the big leagues too. Mm -hmm. And don't forget Master Boney's left-handed. So that kind of gives you that option as well. Uh, let's talk about Scott Boris. You wrote a story. Tell us about your story and where the, where people can go read it. And then that kind of leads us into, uh, you know, Jordan Montgomery dropping Scott Boris. Yeah, back at the end of March, I wrote for uh, Cubs HQ, which you can find, you know, online or on Twitter. Um, Cubs headquarters. I wrote about how Scott Boris had five really big clients heading into this offseason. It was Cody Bellinger, Blake Snell, Jordan Montgomery, JD Martinez, and Matt Chapman. And with all those guys, you heard rumors of 200 and 250 million and 10 year, eight year deals. And um, he expected almost a billion dollars worth of free agent signings combined between those five guys. And he ended up with 233 million. All of the deals are for less than three years, plus they all have opt-outs. So it, he had a, a overwhelmingly disappointing offseason. And then the question I raised in the article is, is this MLB kind of blacklisting Boris and his clients because of the success he's had in the past? Or is it MLB getting afraid of throwing down those 10-year mega deals because they really haven't worked out for anybody so far? Yeah, and, and I feel like this, man. I, I feel like baseball has been held hostage by Scott Boris for a long time. <laughs> and, and I think that teams, the way that the regional sports networks have died, the money isn't the same. They want to work with agents that they feel like are not just trying to do what's best for their client, but trying to do what's best for everyone involved. You know, that's what decision-making is supposed to be like. And I'm going to give you a great example. I learned this from Gary Hughes, who was one of the all-time great baseball people. Uh, baseball America said he was one of the top 10 scouts of the century. He was Jim Hendry's special assistant. And I learned a lot about baseball from him, but I also learned a lot about life from him. And he said, when you make deals, you want deals that everyone wins. If you win and the other person loses, that's not good because then the next time you want to do a deal, they're going to feel like you did them wrong. You know, mm -hmm. what you want is that everybody walks out going, Hey man, we got a good deal. He got a, they got a good deal. We got a good deal and everyone's happy. And I don't feel like the Scott Boris deals have been that way. Baseball has guaranteed money. So if you sign a big contract and you don't live up to it, there's nothing that baseball teams can really do about that. Football, you know, if the Bears sign someone and they don't live up to it, then guess what? They'll they'll get they'll recoup some of that money. So with the regional sports networks suffering in some, you know, with some of the mid-level low market teams, there just wasn't as many people out there that were willing to go so high with these contracts. And instead of taking a deal early, that would have been fair for everyone. His tricks always say, hey, we're just going to wait until the end and, you know, whatever. And, and all of his clients didn't get anywhere near what we thought they were going to get. Yeah, I, I know you think of a few years ago. Uh, I don't remember if it was both Harper and Machado that were his clients, but I know Harper was. And they held out all the way into deep in spring training. And the Phillies gave him, what, 10 years, $330 million or something like that. Um, and you look back to other years, Strasburg, that deal was a fleece. Rendon, mm -hmm. Chris Bryant. I mean, he squeezed a ton of money out for guys that ended up being not worth it. But 
I, I, yeah, like, I don't know if it's MLB being like, I don't want him to burn me again because he's burned me before, Mm -hmm. or if it's just like the general concept of maybe 10 year deals aren't the way to go. Let's do these four years or these five years with some opt outs. And it gives both the player and the team a little bit more flexibility. Like at the end of the day, the Bellinger deal is probably pretty good for both ends. Bellinger gets 30 mil a year. And if he underperforms, he can get 30 mil again yet next year. If he overperforms, he can go out to free agency and try again. So that ends up being pretty fair. It just feels underwhelming because Boris wanted him to get $250 million for an aging player with an injury history. So right. I, I don't, I'm not shocked that Jordan Montgomery is going to be switching teams. He just had the best year of his career and has no job security. He's on a one-year deal. And if he struggles this year, he's screwed pretty much. So, mm-hmm. and you could probably say a lot of that is, is Scott Boris's fault. Um, but like, I'd also be wrong to say Boris isn't good at his job. He's gotten a ton of players, more money than they oh, deserve. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what, you know, his MO is. So it'll be interesting, interesting to see how the MLB moves on with Boris and Boris clients and just kind of the landscape of free agency as a whole, but baseball needs to do something to fix it. Cause it is really boring free agency compared to basketball and football that's so you know they're they're off seasons and they're still grabbing the top headlines and that that shouldn't happen baseball should be should be king so um there's a lot of moving pieces to this but i wouldn't be surprised if a few other clients um go and and sign with somebody else too yeah and look you bring up another great point baseball needs to figure out a way to make free agency as exciting as the NFL and the NBA, right? And maybe have a window for it. The players don't want a window because the strategy is, hey, if I'm not getting what I want, I'll just hold out and keep holding out and keep holding out. But it's not good for the game. What's good right. for the game is have a window, like with Otani, or, uh, excuse me, with uh, Shota, Imanaga. And we're going to talk about Otani. That's why he's on my mind right now. <laughs> um, Imanaga, right? He And it was because he was coming from, uh, Japan and he had the sign and we knew, and then eventually, you know, the Cubs ended up signing him. uh, Jed Hoyer with a fantastic off season, yeah. bringing in some great players and doing it with deals that make sense for both sides. Everyone wins, right? That was one of those deals where because he was posted, he had to have it done, you know, in early January. And then they ended up making it work. Right. I would love to see something like that in baseball. Um, I, I'm, I'm not for the players. I'm not for the owners. I'm for the fans. And I think that we have gotten so far from that. And that's one of the reasons why baseball keeps losing popularity. If we were always focused on doing what's best for the paying customer, then we would have a much better game. And, and that's the bottom line. And, and I never feel like it's about that. It always seems like it's about the owners. It's about the players. It's about without the fans. The owners and the players would be broke. They wouldn't be doing this. Right. That's a good point. I think a lot of times you get on these uh, sports talk radio or even like MLB network and you see people siding with the owners or siding with the players. And I typically lean a little bit more player, but the fact of the matter is like, you shouldn't have to lean either way. They, they should both be working for you. Like that's the name of the game. And, um, it's definitely interesting, but you do bring up a good point with free agency. And I'm thinking like the most entertaining free agency baseball had was in 2021, right before the lockout, when all those moves came right before baseball locked everybody out. And it sucks that you had to wait for a lockout that put the future of the game in jeopardy just to get a little bit of entertainment in the off season. But I, I, I like the idea of a deadline, like the trade deadline. Baseball is the best trade deadline of any sport. I don't think anybody would argue that yeah, like that day is a ton of fun because it's all focused. There's a deadline and people start panicking. And they make moves right at the deadline. Why can't we have that for free agency? It works in the middle of the season. Yeah. Great point. All right. Let's, let's change gears. I told you we were going to talk Otani. We're going to talk Otani. We did during the off season when the Cubs were in the mix for him. And it could be a blessing that the Cubs didn't get Otani. Otani was going to the Dodgers the entire time. We found that out, although the Cubs and, and a lot of other teams were interested. Why wouldn't you be on the field? He's fantastic. His interpreter now is being charged with stealing $16 million from Otani to pay gambling debts. Um, this just doesn't smell right to me. 
The story's changed three times since it came out. First, it was Otani was covering his debts to help the guy out. Then the guy stole from him, and then Otani didn't know anything about it. Major League Baseball banned the best player of my lifetime for gambling, Pete Rose. You know, the hit king, right? A guy that was known for hustling and playing the game tough, but he gambled on the game, and they kicked him out of baseball. It feels like to me that baseball would rather throw an interpreter under the bus, almost exactly like what happened with Houston, rather than really look at this for what it looks like. The interpreter doesn't have $16 million. Gamblers wouldn't even front the guy $16 million when you're making like, even if he's making $300,000 a year, this just, do this doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I, I mean, well, for starters, it was Jeff Passan who reported it, and I trust him. He's one of the oh, best great. in the game. So, like, that part, I believe that the interpreter was charged with stealing $16 million. Yeah. Like, that we know is a fact because it came from Jeff Passan. But you mentioned the story changing all these times. Like, first of all, you hear um, that it – well, we know off the bat it has something to do with Shohei and the interpreter. And, mm -hmm. and first you hear that the interpreter stole money. Then you hear that Shohei covered him, the debts, and then immediately backtracked because that would mean he's tied into gambling. So now it's the interpreter stealing it. And then, you know, there's rumors that the interpreter never told him. There's rumors that the interpreter went into Otani's bank account and turned off notifications and took the money. There's all these different rumors. We don't know much. But what we do know is that this is the most marketable player baseball has ever had. Yeah. And putting him off the field via suspension, a ban, whatever the case may be, is about the worst thing that could happen for the league. So I don't know if it's Rob Manfred making a decision to say like, hey, whatever we got to do, we got to protect this guy. If that's the case, somebody should call Pete Rose and say, hey, dude, you're back. <laughs> uh, like no matter what, it's a sticky situation. But, you know, if it is the interpreter, I just don't know. You know, I, I don't have millions and millions of dollars, but I'm pretty sure anybody would notice 16 million is missing. Yeah, like, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if it came in ones and twos. That's still a lot of money to not have. And on the flip side, if he is, you know, a gambler, and that's also bad because according to precedent, which baseball historians love precedent, according to precedent, you have to ban him. So like, it's a really tricky situation. I'm not going to talk about what I believe or who I believe because I really don't know. But what I do know is in the MLB hall of fame, the guy with the most hits, the guy with the most Cy Youngs and the guy with the most home runs do not exist in the hall of fame. And that's a problem for the game. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm a little bit worried about whatever comes from this Otani situation. Yeah. Great points. And for me, you know what? I'm just an objective journalist here. You know, put my journalistic hat on. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't smell right. Yeah, there are more questions to be asked. And when you have the guy not taking questions from the media, that raises your eyebrow even more. And when the story changes a second and a third time, now both eyebrows are, are raised. So it's there's stuff we don't know and probably things we'll never know, which mm -hmm. is not fair, especially when you put your journalistic hat on because your job is is to find the truth and report the truth. And it seems like the truth is being hidden somewhere in between this mix. Yeah. Right. In plain sight, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> $16 million. Like that's just, you, you just, even a rich guy like him, $16 million. That's if the, if the interpreter really pulled this off, it'd be one of the all time great heists. <laughs> I don't buy it. You can make a movie about it. Ocean's what? 14. And yeah. Yeah. I don't money buy from it. Shohei. I don't buy any of this <laughs> because look, when you're, when you have Otani money, $16 million is six. It's, it's, it's a lot, but it's not, you're not worried about it. I mean, just if you're, if your buddy right was in dire need and you had, you know, more than enough money and your, your buddy was like, dude, I need 16 million. You'd give it to him. Ah. Uh, Sick, I I don't know about that. <laughs> like, I don't know. I maybe like, like you know. I mean, that's sixteen million dollars. Man, that's you a had lot like of money to get like Shohei money, and this guy was your best friend in the world and desperate. I feel like you'd do it so he doesn't get his you know kneecaps broken. Well, you you know what the thing about it is, you are giving him the shadow of a doubt that he needs from a, a jury because I'm 
I I'm feeling guilty. And then, you know, you're throwing it out there. So that's maybe that's why this thing is where it is right now. So you're thinking Shohei gambles and the interpreter is just taking the heat. Yeah. Like, or they do it together or something, you know, like they're, mm -hmm. they're kind of like, that's fun for them. You know, like that. I don't think Otani cares about the money, like winning the money. I think yeah. it's just the fun. It would be the fun of, Hey, you know, just doing it right. Gives you like Pete Rose, the thrill of just ha being yeah. in the game, you know, afterwards, um, you know, Michael Jordan, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. known for, you know, being someone that likes to gamble as well. Um, There's there's two things about it that really stick out to me. And one of them is that like they looked back at the bets that were placed and they were all placed on days that Otani pitched like crap. So hmm. like that, that's a factor, like whether or not he bet it or not, like Otani giving up six runs to the A's and, and you're betting like A's money line and A's over, like that'll raise your eyebrow That'd for sure. Weird. God, that and, would be now nah, it's a whole different ball game right there. <laughs> yeah. And then the other um the other thing about it too is like I don't understand how he was with the Los Angeles Angels for seven, six years, seven years. I don't know the exact number, but he's been in the league a while. And then he comes to the Dodgers, and all of a sudden you find out that he's potentially a gambling addict and he and he's married. And that stuff was all under the rug for for that long. Like I don't understand. Why now all of a sudden right, everything's coming out, you. you know, let me explain this to you. If you're in the white Sox, you can go under the rug. Sure. It's true. Right. No, one, yeah. it's, it's like, it's the same city, but the minute you go to the Cubs, everything you do is magnified by 50. It's that's true. You know, but like, in this era, like, I don't know how you hide a wife. I don't know, but it's like, you're with the Dodgers are kind of the same thing. Like, the Dodgers and the Cubs and the Yankees and the Red Sox, maybe even the Giants, but that's it. Like those five teams, like, and you know, and, and the funny thing about it is of those teams, Boston's the only one that doesn't have like a sidekick in the same yeah. city. Right. They used to, they're in Atlanta now. Right. So uh, it's pretty funny though. Like you kind of look at it that way, but the, the media scrutiny for, those four teams and you know maybe the giants too but uh um, he's a little too yeah but i see i don't i don't put them in that same that same boat. right right i agree you know it's like I, i've seen it with the cubs like they, there was a story one time where the cubs threw away some stuff that they had from a party that they threw for wrigley field's you know birthday and i'm thinking like if this was the white Sox that threw the stuff away from the party like no one would care, but mm -hmm. since it's the Cubs, it's like a big deal. Like, Hey, here's that birthday cake. It's in the trash can. You know, here's the, the party favors and, you know, and like everybody's going crazy. I would have taken that, you know, like <laughs> then it was like, that's the difference to me. But well, I, I don't know, man. Like, I hope you're right. And I'm wrong because it's better for I, baseball it would be so I'm bad. Right. For, yeah. It'd be so bad for the game because yeah. Otani is, he really is the Japanese Babe Ruth, and there's no arguing that he's the most electrifying player in the game right now when he's pitching and he's hitting. Mm -hmm. So I, I hate that part of it. But the, you know, I, 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 I'll say this, man. I, I grew up in a place where you had to have street smarts, and nothing about this story to me feels like the interpreter was stealing $16 million from a guy. Yeah. Every, every bit of my, my street, smarts yeah you know all the buzzers are going on. ah every one of them's like no chance there's yeah. just no chance here and i'm but i'm with you though where i do like giving people the benefit of the doubt we're supposed to you know like uh, and how often have we taken up for trevor bauer at least i have you know and and i feel like it's you you should be innocent until proven guilty. I, I I don't disagree with that. It's the way our system works. So he's getting Otani's getting a big benefit of the doubt right now. But the FBI is involved in this. That's how the whole thing came to light. That's why no one knew about it when he was in L.A. It just with the Angels because it, it really wasn't there yet. It, this has some kind of organized crime type feel to it. So we'll see what happens with the FBI. And, you know, crazier things have happened in, in the world of baseball. I mean, we had a team that was using electronic devices to win a World Series. And yeah. No no one got suspended. So yeah, baseball has all these scandals. No other sport has these scandals. I know. I know steroids. We did the steroids. We had the greenies. 
You know, baseball is the sport that that kept black players out, which really dilutes to me the history just because we really don't know who the best players were if Satchel Paige wasn't in the in the game and mm -hmm. you know um Josh Gibson wasn't in there we didn't have cool Papa Bell I mean I guess we did have Satch but it was late in his career it just seems like baseball's always kind of had something going on like this so yeah we'll see we'll see what happens but um but you bring up some great points and I guess that kind of leads us to uh showdown tonight in Seattle what do you got yeah we got a game tonight Jordan Wicks on the mound for the Cubs um he He's got a 4.15 ERA, but I think everybody that has watched him would tell you he's pitched better than that 4.15 ERA. He's been on the wrong side of some some bad defensive plays, um, so I can almost guarantee you Madrigal is going to get the go, and hopefully Horner, back from a few days off, is going to get the start at second. You're going to get your best defensive lineup out there and just hope and pray Wicks gives you six innings. He's got to go deep into this game. I know you're coming off an off, off day, but – the deeper you get, the better. Uh, but they're going up against a really talented guy in Bryce Miller. He's one and one on the year for the Mariners. He's on my fantasy team, but I might bench him because they're playing the Cubs today, and I don't want to root for anybody against my Cubbies. But he's he's been good this year. He's part of that young rotation that many expect or, or revere as one of the best in the game. So it's Wicks against Miller tonight, and uh, I'm excited. I think Wicks is uh, – continuing to take that step this year and uh, i'm looking forward to seeing him pitch today yep late night late Another night one. so take a nap yeah <laughs> might go might go down right after this <laughs> that's a good idea <laughs> those late night games really are late night mm -hmm. so hopefully we get a pitcher's duel give me like two hours uh, yeah you know so anyway well guys thanks for hanging out well let's get give me your opinions what do you guys think about otani uh, you, you aunt or me you know what what are you thinking here somewhere in the middle yeah um but we want to hear from you what do you think about wisdom where's he go uh who do you take out love the comments in the comment section thank you guys for hanging out with us make sure that you uh share with your cubs friends and uh subscribe to the channel and we will talk to you guys again real soon go cubs